Viewer discretion is advised. My research had led me to a small island off the coast of northern Japan. It was speculated that there was some hidden temple in the area, full of artifacts, buried by time and waiting to be dug up. But on one cold winter day while milling about the dig site, I saw something that didn't match the browns, greens, and grays of nature that surrounded the area. Instead, my eyes were transfixed on a large patch of golden brown. Curious and confused by this, I left my crew behind and wandered through some trees before I found myself standing in front of it. I slowly crouched down and ran my hands through it and was stunned to feel that it felt like fur. Deeply puzzled, I took out my pocket knife and took a small sample to analyze without telling any of my peers. After a few hours of testing, the results indicated that what I had found was indeed fur. Fur that belonged to a corgi, as a matter of fact. Baffled by this, I quickly gathered up the other archaeologists and researchers and showed them my discovery. We all were stumped as to how it was possible for the fur to be so well preserved but excited nonetheless. We quickly posted our findings online and turned our attention back to digging up the area. Pretty soon, we discovered that this mass of fur kept going and going no matter how far we excavated the area. Around a week later, we were met by Japanese officials and some odd man who went by Agent S. He instructed us that we were to close up immediately and that our dig was to be taken over by the Japanese government. Oh well, I hope whoever they are, they have the means to take good care of this furry creature have a feeling that it means us no harm. Could be an actual corgi, I wonder. Hello everybody, I'm The Rubber. Today, we bring you SCP Foundation Safe Class Object SCP-2952. SCP-2952, also known as C-O-R-G-I, is classified as safe and is most likely one of the most bizarre and adorable anomalous entities that the Foundation has come across. Many Foundation researchers are proud to report that 2952 is an anomalous Pembroke Welsh Corgi. What makes this Corgi unique is the fact that it is just shy of over 30,000 kilometers in length. Its little head and front paws are located near three Portlands while its hindquarters are in rural Japan. The rest of its body weaves across the Americas, Europe, and Asia. Furthermore, 2952 is thought to have the ability to infinitely regenerate through unknown means. Should any part of its body be damaged, it will repair itself very quickly. Samples of tissue taken have proven to be capable of rebuilding themselves regardless of what damage it sustains. As to how this is possible, no one knows. Oddly enough, 2952 does not require sustenance of any kind and refuses to move more than a few feet away from its original position. Something that has been speculated is that 2952 is able to change the shape of its body, making it thinner or larger in places. This is thought to help keep its body out of sight by the general public and dangerous animals, or as a way to blend in with the environment. This has only been seen once in an incident involving archaeologists in rural Japan, who have since had their memories of 2952 removed. Other than the incredible length of 2952, its body seems to operate as a unique and anomalous transportation system. Travel is done through tiny openings a few centimeters wide and tall on its body that open on a schedule. These entrances have been designated as SCP-2952-1. Humanoid beings around 3 centimeters in height can be seen entering and exiting such openings. Such entities are not visible to the naked eye unless captured on film or through photographs. None are outwardly hostile unless provoked and have been designated as SCP-2952-2. Many of them share physical characteristics of fairies and forest nymphs, but on a much smaller scale. An experiment was undertaken by Project Director Stevens who ordered several Foundation personnel to block and bury portions of 2952. This was done in order to prevent the general public from stumbling across its body. A few days after this was complete, Director Stevens went missing. In his place was a mole that was dressed up to look like Director Stevens. Dr. Mills, who was working alongside the crew and was tasked with collecting tissue samples, woke up one morning with poisonous berries in his mouth and sharpened stakes driven through his feet and hands. Believing these two events to be directly related to 2952, the Foundation researched all myths related to fairies and similar entities. 
After collecting a plethora of information, they found all the possible ways to appease such creatures and performed all the rituals necessary. As soon as a number of rituals were completed, Director Stevens switched places with the mole. He has stated he has no recollection of what happened while he was gone. As for Dr. Mills, he was no longer harassed by instances of 2952-2. However, the wounds he sustained have not healed. Modern medicine nor anomalous means have proven successful in closing his wounds. The instances of 2952-2 sent a letter to Foundation personnel stating they were content with the appeasement but to never block the gates again. The Foundation has since dedicated a task force to ensure that no gates are ever blocked by any means. As a reward, members of the Foundation have been granted the privilege of being capable of seeing instances of 2952-2 with the naked eye. Agent Davies was sent to explore the transportation system located within 2952. She touched 2952's warm, furry body and shrunk down to a size no more than an inch. Then she was granted entrance. Inside were around a dozen or so instances of 2952-2, sitting down on wooden benches covered in petals. Now departing from three Portlands, next stop, West Coast Rainforest. Agent Davies looked around the interior. It looked just like the usual L trains, but more in tune with nature. Everything was made of wood, leaves, grass, moss, mushrooms, and the like. The walls, ceiling and floor appeared to be constructed of birch bark wrapped around thin twigs. The walls were lined with seats, which are cushioned with a variety of flower petals. A welcoming sight, considering her expectation of the dog's interior to be more fleshy. Also a good escape from the Foundation's dour and hard floors. As she sat down, Agent Davies heard a voice from her earpiece. Agent, you are free to engage in conversation if needed. Well, all right then. Tech seems to be unaffected by the changes in environment. Good to know. Time to get in touch with nature. Agent Davies noticed that the 2952-2 entities resembled humans, but were of earthly skin tones. Some had wings, others had vegetation growing out of their bodies, most of them were rather jovial and acted just like humans. Agent Davies casually sat beside one of them. Hey, uh, how's it going? Beautiful day, huh? Well, you know, I just hope this thing isn't late again. I tried to make it to the glades in time to harvest some seeds the other day. Everything was gone by the time I arrived. But, you know, that's how it is sometimes. Do you know why it's been late? Some kind of internal blockage. Poor things got injuries somewhere down in the tail section, I hear. Aw, oh, poor thing. Another passenger from the front turned towards them and joined their conversation. Somebody tried to hijack this train, you see. Wait, a hijacker? So was it like a human or... He was one of us, I think. I don't know. He was dressed in all black and had a mask on. Pretty bold, too. Hijacking the train with just himself. Can you tell me what happened? Well, it was just a usual Tuesday. I was taking the train as usual from my place to where I harvest my mushrooms. I was sitting in the tail section, that's where I usually sit. It was pretty mundane, but damn, do I regret what I was thinking that day. Man, I hope something exciting would happen to me. This is so boring. <sighs> what the hell was that? Suddenly, something loud came from behind where I was sitting. A man dressed in all black pulled out his revolver and fired a single shot in the air. I mean upwards. It hit the roof and the train shook a little. All right, nobody moves. If it ain't clear enough, this is a hijacking situation. I have a gun and a bomb hidden somewhere in this car. If I press this button right here, train goes boom. So no sudden movement. Don't try to be a hero. The passenger under his boot asked him in a shaky voice. Oh, what do you want, man? What do I want? It's very simple. I want you to shut the hell up and stay down. The hijacker seemed to know the train pretty well, including the conductor too. He then spoke into one of the surveillance cameras that was hidden really well, or at least that's what I think he was doing. If you don't want the train or your good boy to blow up right now, be here immediately. That entire car waited for an uncomfortable 10 minutes or so, but no one replied from the intercom or showed up. Everyone was on edge. The hijacker was getting impatient too. Why don't you tell us what you want and we work it out? I don't know what came over me that made me start negotiating with him. 
Not gonna lie, my heart dropped and I was about to wet my pants when he suddenly glared and pointed his gun at me. Ooh, someone's trying to play hero, huh? All right, I'll entertain you. What I want is very simple. I want this train to stop its operation. No more joy rides across the world. That, that, that's it? Yep, plain and simple. I hate dog trains. Suddenly, he was overcome with rage and fired more shots into the roof. Poor thing must have felt them. Each time he fired, the train shook more violently. I couldn't take it anymore, and I was not the only one who thought the same during that moment. You are a despicable, hateful, and joyless being. I tried to reason with you, but that was simply unreasonable. How can you not like Corgi? Yeah, how can you say such things about something this, this cute? At that point, everyone seemed like they were ready to jump on him, even when the hijacker was waving his gun around. Hey, hey, stop moving, you all. You don't want to get shot now, do you? I still have the bomb. Ugh. The train suddenly swerved hard. It made everyone lose balance for a second. Corgi must have known what was going on and tried to help us. Most of us seized the opportunity to rush towards the hijacker to bring him down. I got a hold of his gun arm and he fired more shots recklessly, but eventually I got control of the gun and pointed it back at him. Stop, I still have my detonator. If I press this button, somehow he still had his detonator in his hand. Oh yeah, but can you react faster than this gun here? Right now, I have it right up against your head and you gotta ask yourself one question. Did you fire six shots or only five? I'm sure in all this commotion, you've lost track of it yourself. But being at the other end of the barrel, one squeeze from my finger can blow your head clean off. So ask yourself another question. Do I feel lucky? Well, do you, punk? He was shaking then and slowly let go of his detonator. And the day was saved. Did you really say that? I swear I heard that speech somewhere. Well, I guess you'll have to take my word for it then and I'm afraid I'll have to leave you now. This is my station. As the passenger got up, Agent Davies stopped him. Wait, before you leave, tell me, was it five shots or six? I got to know. The passenger only chuckled and left the train. At the end of her trip, she ended up in the West Coast rainforest where Foundation personnel were waiting to pick her up. So, how was your little trip? A good bit of fun. Wouldn't mind commuting to work like that every day, actually. Hey, you have the number of the vet you took your dog to the other day? All right, think we're all done here now. He gathered his tools and stepped out of 2952. He then patted its side. Good boy. He could see its tail further down the dog train, wagging happily. <laughs>